So I'll um I'll hit record whenever you're ready. And... I'm ready. Okie dokie. And how much time do you want to do today? Like, what's well, your schedule like? Well, I think I have to be somewhere at 5.30, so I can't really go too long. If you want to break it up in okay. two parts, that's fine, too. I don't know how long the material we've got. We can always do a, a part two as well if, if um you know. Perfect. It's I mean, you can't ever exhaust Chesterton, so. Right. Well, awesome. that'd be good, because then I could actually follow up on my reading. But let me just do a kind of a semi-formal intro. If that's right. It's it's so good. Okay. okay. All right. Go ahead. Three, right. two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, a returning guest. His name is Michael Basham. He is the proprietor and uh, head host of the show Spirit Wars uh, that I found out and know about through the Fringe Radio Network. His show is uh, the most listened to show on that network. So it's really a delight to have him on my show. And the subject we're going to talk about tonight is G.K. Chesterton, somebody who came to my attention through my researches of Aleister Crowley, not somebody I knew very much in detail, but Mike Basham knows a lot about G.K. Chesterton, and he did a show that I listened to with great interest about The Everlasting Man, which is a book that he really enjoyed. So I tried to do some reading on Chesterton myself, uh, read his book, Orthodoxy, which I found uh, profoundly interesting, but uh, we're just going to kind of talk about some stuff, but Mike, are you there? Hello. Hello, William Ramsey. It is a delight to be here today again. Good. I will. Well, I'm, I works of Chesterton here on my Amazon Kindle, profoundly great. created by Mr. Bezos for us to awesome. enjoy. So you can get Chesterton wherever you are in lovely Hawaii and, uh, you know, get some pretty deep thinking uh, associated with Christianity. And I think actually some of his topics I, was, I found of interest when I was reading Orthodoxy was how timely he was because yes. he was addressing the liberalism of his day, evolutionism, materialism, these big kind of uh, loaded terms, but really trying to address them from a Christian perspective. So I really appreciated that in Orthodoxy. But maybe uh, for the people who don't know your name, maybe talk a little bit about your background and how you became interested in Chesterton. We can start from there. Oh, yes. Well, um, I uh, found Chesterton in a Jesuit university in Tokyo, which I was obsessed with Japanese culture and um, coming from a kind of a Christian. Um, my grandfather, Don Basham, helping to sort of organize the charismatic Holy Spirit deliverance ministry stuff with Derek Prince. I was never exposed to Catholicism in any way, shape or form. And when I found Chesterton, along with my grandfather's book in the dormitory where I was in in Tokyo um, being you know separated from all my friends family you know I'm a big family guy a seeker of the spirit and and you know one, one that wants to find the truth you know really walk with the Lord and but I found something in, in Everlasting Man one day in Peter Millward's office who had a letter from C.S. Lewis and had attended Tolkien's lectures and on his desk the Chesterton Award for 2003 um, I was so amazed by this meeting. I was like, wow, maybe I can just join him and study in the Renaissance Institute in Tokyo. And he was from England, really sweet, humble, kind of funny guy, a little bit like Chesterton humor wise. And, um, but that very night um, I ended up meeting the family international and ended up joining the famous cult of which we spoke about last time, <laughs> the children of God all over the world. And, um, they introduced me to some more of this like info war mystic type of Christianity, but Chesterton remains as kind of a, a lighthouse of truth and a foundation of not just Christendom, but all reality connecting to everything literary and just our Western culture at its core. I would say that he's probably the most influential person I've ever come into contact with just pouring over those pages of everlasting man which c.s lewis in his autobiography said got him saved basically that was the final straw for him and um i'm here in this liberal university listening to horrible lectures by just total god-awful human hating professors and then i would go home and just like just drink chesterton like <gasps> you know it was it was just man i mean we, we're gonna talk about it today but I'm interested to see your your perspective on it, especially with your um, 
understanding of Crowley and for what you're most known for, um, you actually found the quote from Crowley about Chesterton. I thought that was amazing. Well, there's a number of quotes actually that I included in my book, uh, Prophet of Evil. There, there was something, Crowley really thought of Chesterton as an intellectual equal, but he, uh, there was a, one thing that I had had was a, a critique of Crowley's Soul of Osiris by Chesterton. And then the, there was something that Crowley, he penned something called Why Jesus Wept, which was an anti-Christian text, and he, he dedicated part of it to Mr. Chesterton. So he seemed to think that he was uh, kind of countering, I think, Chesterton's pro-Christianity with his own anti. But I can read the uh, quote from G.K. Chesterton. He says, if Mr. Crowley and the New Mystics think that one, excuse me, if Mr. Crowley and the New Mystics think for one moment that a broken temple of Osiris is more supernatural than a Baptist chapel in Brixton, then they are sectarians, and only sectarians of no more value to humanity than those who think that the English soil is the only soil we're worth defending. Mr. Crowley is a strong and genuine poet, and we have little doubt that he will work up from his appreciation of the temple of Osiris that loftier and wider work of the human imagination, the appreciation of the Brixton chapel. So that was something that uh, Chesterton wrote about Crowley, and then Crowley. This is before he had this kind of self-professed revelation in Egypt in 1904, where he received the Book of the Law, but he writes to Chesterton, Dedicatio Extraordinaria in Latin. Mr. Dear Mr. Chesterton, alone among the puerile apologists of your detestable religion, you hold a reasonably mystic head above the tides of criticism. You are the last champion of God. With you, I choose to measure myself. Others I can despise. You are a force to be reckoned with as Browning, your intellectual father, was before you. Whether whether we are indeed friends or enemies, it is perhaps hard to say. It has sometimes seemed to me that human freedom and happiness are our common goal, but that you found your muddied oafs in gods, ministers, passive resistors, and all the religious team. The Brixton Bahinchets, I don't even know what that word means. We might call them. While I, at once a higher mystic and colder skeptic, found my Messiah, in Charles Watts and the devil and all his angels. The occasion of this letter is the insertion, insertion of a scene equivalent to an appreciation of the Brixton Chapel. So he's referencing uh, Chesterton's earlier analysis of Crowley in my masterpiece, Why Jesus Wept, and I hope you will like it. Can I do more than make your Brixton my deus ex machina? You see, when I wrote The Soul of Osiris, Europe was my utmost in travel. Today, what country of the globe is not shuddered with joy, with the joy of my presence? The virgin snows of Chogori, the gloomy jungles of Burma, filled with savage buffaloes and murderous chins, the peace of Waikiki, the breeding, hopeful putrefaction of America, the lonely volcanoes of Mexico, the everlasting furnace sands of Egypt, all these have known me. Travel thou thus far, thou also. Somewhat shalt thou learn. But otherwise, gird on thine armor for thy Christ, O champion of the dying faith in man dead. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, oh, and then he says, arm, arm, and out. For the young warrior a new, of a new religion is upon thee, and his number is the number of a man. So uh, he wrote. Amazing. Us, and yeah. when you mentioned Waikiki, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, we just moved there. And we're like, why are we here? It's like a hellhole of crime and filth and villainy. And in the Dagobah star system, <laughs> you will never find a more villainous hive you know right well it looks um, good on the map right all the postcards look legit the and then you get there yeah but there's so much crime here i wouldn't be surprised if uh crowley left his mark wouldn't be surprised place. but uh yeah so that was really kind of my intro to chesterton so okay uh i have okay. not read the everlasting man i did read orthodoxy which i thought man I, it's one of those books you finish and you go okay i gotta start again because yeah it's a uh, very very kind of compact concepts and things that you know you kind of need to uh definitely take some time to unpack but i think i got the gist of it i thought it was a very pretty fascinating very well reasoned ordered book definitely couched in his time like uh very uh you could call it turgid prose you could call it very deep prose but he odd like they called him uh, chesterton the was it the author of paradox so he uses he uses these Yes. Opposing concepts and then really kind of 
investigates each of them, you know, whether a reason and imagination, uh, these kind of things, and then really unpacks it. But he also has references of people he knew and Crowley knew. So you kind of see these same characters that Crowley's bringing up with Yates, yes. William Butler Yates, and Annie Besant, and actually addresses them. So it's actually very, I found him to be not really some kind of dusty old thinker that no, no. Uh, is, was something for the yeah. really dated. I found him very contemporary in his, in his uh, mm-hmm. outlook and insights. Yeah. The greatest um, novelist of our time, American novelist, Michael Crichton, that wrote Jurassic Park, before he died, he discovered Chesterton and he wrote about him just with the same kind of um, reaction and saying, well, this, a lot of the, the content obviously needs to be updated. A lot of the references people are totally lost on, but he was a contemporary. He was someone that was interfacing with the people like HG Wells who wrote new world order. And he was diametrically opposed to their philosophies. And these were the birthing of the Nazis and the communists and all these philosophies. And when you read, um, I mean, at least on my uh, ebook here, the one after our orthodoxy is a book called what's wrong with the world. And this book is a collection of essays, which really just discuss the importance of humanity, the beauty of family and, and the necessary, you know, the necessity of protection of property. Um, and then he, he just against that, the backdrop of all the just total craziness of what, what then were the libtards, the, the kind of the people, the AOCs and the Clintons and these people that are just such slick liars today. Well, their progenitors, their Genesis were these people that Chesterton was interfacing with all the time. And he was friends with them. He would sit down and have, have a cup of tea, you know, and talk with them. But, but with Crowley, he would not meet. I looked that up and I was like, Whoa. I he did not want to, he was like the most disgusting, detestable person I've ever come into contact with. And I, you know, he invited me to come talk with him and, and he was just like this guy. And obviously I'm, I haven't been reading enough Chesterton really to sound so done darn smart in these days. That's why I'm wearing these lashes. <laughs> <laughs> they're just sunglasses i break i poked out the glass <laughs> um, it makes you look studious Ew, indeed my wife bought this tie she's like you're finally wearing it <laughs> so like, yeah it's the first time i've ever worn it um you know uh but the feminism the you know he goes into what is so mysteriously mystically wonderful about women but then he destroys feminism while almost creating goddesses out of the females i mean it's amazing how he i would really recommend what's wrong with the world as one of these you kind of just pick up an essay and and read it in an hour or less just studiously read some of his um not even an hour you can probably go go through it in like a couple in uh, in like 20 minutes or so but um what did you find in orthodoxy that that really struck you like I'll, i'll open it up and maybe we can go through anything in there that that was really uh on your heart. Well, I would just say that he, uh, just the kind of the way he addressed his faith, that he was really just bolstering what he thought was the Apostles' Creed, but the way he went about it was not coming straight out and talking about the Apostles' Creed. He actually started off in orthodoxy talking about the insane asylum because he wrote the book near an insane, I can't remember the way, which the name of the asylum was in northwestern London, but he kept referencing. So he's talking about human reason and imagination and kind of counterpoising those concepts and really came out and said, imagination is the safeguard of the mind and human spirit. And that human reason always ends up into this place over here, this crazy, crazy house. And so once he starts laying out these chapters, there's nine chapters in the book, but his summation in the last two chapters, I think are fantastic because he keeps kind of putting these opposites together, unpacking them. And then the summation is, okay, this is why we believe what we believe in Christendom. So I think, uh, I mean, he said, and, you know, he kind of like included, included this notion of romance. So he really bolstered the aspect of Christianity of not, not knowing, not actually knowing everything, but willing to accept things that you don't know. And I think one of the chapters was the was it the romance of uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it was the romance. What's the name of the chapter? Um, romance, romance of our orthodoxy. 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 So, yeah, so he yeah. talks about orthodoxy, but I think in the common, and he doesn't mean orthodox Catholic church or anything like that. No. He really means the orthodox ideas, but I think that you, most people would think of a door orthodoxy, at least uh, my, I would at least think of it as kind of like, okay, this is this, you know, lettered notions within Christendom. But I think the yes. way that he thought about it was that all of these things really made sense. The fall of man, original sin, mm -hmm. things that we take for granted. So I think that, you know, those were, those were definite themes within the book, but I like the way, you know, when I, when I kind of was able to digest it, I like the way that he came at it because he came at it not really oblique, but he took his time talking about concerns that people have about, he actually talked a lot about evolutionary. So this kind of man-based reason, really, he spent time on before he, he used all of those critiques from the earlier chapters in his summation in the last two chapters. So those are just some of the, the takeaways that... Uh, that I mean, you can see the kind of way that Chesterton thinks too, is that he's not afraid of paradox and he's not afraid yeah. of really kind of like looking at the op, op, really giving axioms greater meaning by looking at their opposite, you know, logical syllogism, if you will. So like how he will take a word and then flip it and then unpack it. So you see him doing that over and over again. And that's really kind of like was an element of, for me, an element of, st of his style that was unique. But uh, yeah. very eloquently spoken, Mr. Ramsey and Professor Ramsey, I would say um, it's so good. It's so exciting for me to see you get into Chesterton and just your mind and your curiosity and balance and take on this is like, yes, yes, William Ramsey versus Chesterton. Yeah. And it's hard to really um, talk about him on the radio or on YouTube because what usually ends up happening is people read it and it's hard to follow. I mean, this, this is a quote from Orthodoxy that I pulled up here, just that one of the most interesting points that he always brings out in every book, practically in every writing is that ordinary things are more valuable than extraordinary things. Nay, they are more extraordinary. And the idea that just normal everyday things in life have almost like an elf land mystical quality to them. Um, the man in one of his novels breaking into a house, going in through the roof and, you know, coming in and, and looking through his, the stuff on the desk and then the door opens and a woman appears there and you find out it's his house. That's his wife. And he's just having fun breaking into his own house to make it more, amazing and he wrote a lot of uh, detective fiction which i don't think bbc did a super good job with uh, father brown but um the the whole idea of a priest is is the best detective because he knows original sin he's so acquainted with the fallen nature of human of humanity so he's excellent at just figuring out who's who done it kind of things right. um but with the ethic, the ethics of Elfland, I thought was a really, really great chapter in Orthodoxy. Um, the way that he does sort of take his time to get to the point in the last few paragraphs and then the last few sentences are like these, these like lightning bolts and like fireworks going off. I mean, we just don't have people that write that way anymore. No, I don't um, think so. It's not, but it's not, uh, what do you call it? Fashionable to write like. And people, I've heard criticism about him and I've kind of moved away from C.S. Lewis back into Chesterton and I'm like, man, you got to read Chesterton. And I met a, a Catholic that was like, I don't really like Chesterton because at least C.S. Lewis gives you the ability to debate with him. But Chesterton is just like, nope, this is it. This is the truth. And I thought that was interesting. Like, it's so difficult to fight Chesterton that I think what modern intelligentsia has done is they've just kind of buried him and hope that people won't find him. And then the Catholics kind of just read him and worship him, but they, you don't really know what's going on half the time. So I want to read a quote from the ethics of Elfland in that chapter. It was uh, I think chapter four, but it says, uh, and the strongest emotion was that life was as precious as it was puzzling. It was an ecstasy because it was an adventure. It was an adventure because it was an opportunity. The goodness of the fairy tale was not affected by the fact 
that there might be more dragons and princesses. It was good to be in a fairy tale. So in some ways, you know, that's the way he's looking at it. And then in that chapter, he also references Crowley's antagonist and contemporary W.B. Yeats, like we talked about in the pre-show. But uh, he says, he says, here's, a, here's a, his quote of Yeats, right on the crest of the disheveled tide and dance upon the mountains like a, fr- like a flame. It is a dreadful thing to say that Mr. W.B. Yeats does not understand fairyland, but I do say it. That's interesting that he, you know, it's just a part of his, he was very, uh, obviously in his writing, he was very well acquainted with what was going on in the world at that time, you know, referencing people, artists. And I would call him a kind of what I call Crowley, which is a literature, which is a word that probably isn't bandied about much, but it really encompasses nonfiction, fiction, articles, you know, everything. Indeed, yeah, he um almost is one of these tries to do everything type of guys. He even made a, a western movie once with his friends. I mean, he was tackling the very fabric of space time almost in his writings. And people used to criticize him around him and say, "Oh, I don't, I don't believe in you those mystical writings that you provance." And of course, they were probably talking about his Christianity. But when I when I read that, I was like, "Whoa, he's really." actually quite mystic like if you if you were in if you get in a very relaxed nice couch like the one that my neighbor scott helped me get from goodwill i got a nice little sofa here with a with a with a, a, a lamp and you can just you just sit here and just oh there we're going to read oh some some chesterton and oh, fetch some tea and, and make sure the children are off in the garden playing and and you can almost have like a drug trip and I believe me, I wasn't even drinking or any kind of substances at all. Maybe the occasional cigarette when I found Chesterton, but I would literally feel like I was being transported into this, not just on a, a weird magical trip into fairyland, but like the intellect, if you can somehow merge with the intellect of Chesterton, suddenly you have this kind of this mind bending universal understanding of all civilizations, of all, any area that he focuses that laser sight. In Chester, in uh, Everlasting Man, there's one chapter where he's just discussing the fact that rather than what the evolutionists are saying, that civilization is always growing and evolving better and better. He's like, no, look at, let's look at these great mighty facts, these two towers of civilization, Egypt and Babylon. And then he just paints this picture of all their gods and their philosophies and what they attain to and then their decline and their collapse. And, and in, in many ways, they were more advanced and more uh, civilized than civilization today. So he, he uses the, that kind of imagery in your mind. And then he paints this, look, there's nobody that can say that we didn't have civilization long before. That, you know, these civilizations gave you the picture in Egypt and Babylon that, that humanity was already old that there has already been so much that's happened before. Whereas everybody likes to start off with saying, well, we have the, you know, the fertile crescent. And then we had the caveman came out and he's like, no, we just, all we have is just cave drawings from a few. This is what guys do when they go hunting. They're probably just drawing out like, all right, we're going to, Bob, you're going to come from the right. And uh, Tom's going to get the stag from the left. And you go after the mastodon, Charlie. And that's what we do. You know, we build fires and men go out and we do things like that. And so what Chesterton really does is he gives you that ability to step out of the mind control, the MK ultra sort of induced insanity that we live in. You know, we're, we're living in a maniac society. You know, it's, it's really, and it's great that he, I was in the elevator the other day. I was, I was like, man, I, I don't have enough time to prepare for this, this broadcast. Maybe it's good that we're just kind of talking about him universally like this but I, so. I suddenly thought you know chesterton even toyed with insanity like he would take breaks from his intellect and then he would just pretend to be kind of insane and even that was just so fun <laughs> and but that's interesting that you bring up those points because that's part of this orthodoxy is like what is best for man what drives people insane their rationalism but it's also yeah. the component or an aspect of the book is his vast knowledge of civilizations you know 
he even puts things in context, puts the Ten Commandments in the context of a lot of those uh, moralisms were universal at that time, you know, that uh, people will look at it as just like, oh, this comes from, you know, the Jewish, uh, Jewish holy books, but he was like making comparisons. So you see that, that breadth, the depth of his knowledge and contextualizing his ideas within earlier civilizations. And that, you know, is very, it takes a very learned person to be able to inc uh, include that in into the narrative of his book. So I thought that was interesting. Well, he really um, is very needed right now. And I'm so glad that you're introducing him to your audience as kind of we're, we're all caught up in politics these days and oh did you hear about the latest you know uh russia gate garbage or whatever the these mind brainwash i mean these these in total insane maniacs are putting out there when you come back into this type of literature and the joy that is present in everything that he writes there's so much humor there's so much just giddy kind of wit that I started thinking, well, maybe all, maybe all Englishmen kind of have this sort of thing. Well, they do to some extent, you know, it was transferred, I think into Tolkien and in the writings of Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion kind of stuff, but, um, but never to this extent grappling with the enemy. And, it, uh, you know, Crowley really was right when he said that this is the champion of Christendom, kind of a crusader in his time, carrying all of the Victorian, intellect that was from the the previous era because this is literally when was orthodoxy written like 19 1904. doesn't say on my um little little bezos book here um but it was it was before everything had gotten super modern but it was right at the 1908 1908 oh my gosh um but he has in his mind already his training all of that Victorian literature and everything that, that they used to give people back in the day, you'd actually go to school and learn something. And now it's just all, you know, learning about 50 million genders and stuff. Right. Um, but, the, but if we could get a little bit more mystic-y into this, I really want to plumb this Chesterton Crowley paradox. That's something that is, I think, key to, if you look at where we're at right now, where, what Crowley birthed, you know, with Jack Parsons and um, NASA and the Nazi occult weird stuff that, 60s, that we're getting. Right. Before Hitler, I am. Yeah. Famous dictum of Crowley, their statement. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that you can see them still. You're right. I think it's a great point. You can see them as oppositional forces, really, at that time and the present. Yeah. Well, because with Chesterton, you have him birthing sort of the whole, the Lewis, Tolkien kind of where virtue and honor are honored, you know, rather than, ah, the Harry Potter kind of, let's just, you know, do weird hocus pocus stuff. And by the way, the wizard's gay and <laughs> just like whatever. There's but, all there's... kinds of Crowley themes in Harry Potter. The really? The Harry, yeah, absolutely. Even the words 56, Harry Potter, five and a six is... 11, oh, and that. pentagram, and the uh, hexagram. So he's a magician. He's a born magician. There's all kinds of, uh, I mean, the, the wand that he has is 11 inches, which is Crowley's, you know, prime number in the Book of the Law. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it just gets even worse. What is it? The uh, He's an alchemist, Harry Potter. So even Potter references the clay of the alchemist. Yeah. Not the, not the actual real kind of... Uh, material alchemist but the spiritual alchemist right yes somebody who goes so harry potter she was very smart if she even wrote it herself honestly i don't even know if i believe her gestational myth about where harry potter came from because yeah. of the depth of her references and all very 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 intelligent i mean all of the occult stuff the wisdom of the owls all that stuff is there it's just it's just incredible and even like the they go through the 93 and a quarter uh, mm -hmm. window to the next world or go to Hogwarts and there's Crowley's 93 right there so they have to say 93 right oh wow yeah so it's like yeah and you can draw that line right to right through Crowley to her so uh and her apparently she took on that k wasn't even a given name she took on the k the 11th letter of the alphabet for her really? pen her pseudonym yeah 
oh not her God. born name. Yeah. So it gets really heavy duty. Like, um, but, uh, yeah, well, we're, we're looking at this, this culture showdown happening right now. Hold on. Let me, let me wipe off my glasses here. Yeah. Yeah. Culture, <laughs> culture comp culture war. The wars of, of good and evil and light and dark are becoming so evident. I would say even just 15 years ago, it was so more gray. It was hard to know that, you know, Bush was actually kind of involved in something as horrible as 9-11 or that the Hollywood industry could be so controlled by the Illuminati and people like Alex Jones were, were made fun of most of the time. And it was only if you were in some kind of weird counterculture movement that you would even find that stuff to be true or a, maybe a country boy or something, you know, that just somehow knows everything. You would have to study to find out all the Illumina cult stuff. You would either have to be yeah. an X one or take that time to really just look into the, the original text, which takes a lot of time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, having just, I mean, I know we're kind of just broad stroking what Chesterton's writings and, you know, orthodoxy and the, the foundations that he laid. We can talk a little bit more about it, but like, just if you look today at how things are really polarizing, now you, you really see the darkness of the enemy and just with post, post-birth post abortions and the selling of baby parts. Chesterton was the one that first in, in Everlasting Man, I'll never forget that night when I read him talking about the pagans and then the darkness of the former times, but then that with witchcraft, there's always been a hatred of children and innocence. And I remember reading that being like, really? Like, the, yeah. And I, I was thinking all oh, the witch that boils the children, you know, in this, in the pot, but it really is like that. Like That's I had no idea. Well, I was right? sitting in a Jesuit dorm. Like, I mean, who, God knows what was going on there. There was <laughs> priests that, you know, they were so gay with like all the, their boyfriends going down to the big communal um, bath, house downstairs and no offense if anyone's got those tendencies it's not really anything I, i'm gonna judge but it was just like there was weird stuff going on with priests and students in the, the door. catholic church the priesthood is very gay if they're yeah. not pedophiles or they're very but, there's not a lot of ed- heterosexual priests to be honest with you, to my knowledge i just i met some of the I, mean, I believe this peter millward guy was was a good guy i think that they kind of um gaslighted a little bit if that's the right term to have good people in the front working there and then you have the bad ones in the back you know that's that's kind of what i what i found in the cult that i was in too the the children of god is the same thing most people were pretty good but it was just controlled by people that had this extreme satanic kind of pedophile tendency or whatever so at the top of the catholic church there's a lot of occultism even the catholic structures and stuff they're yeah, there's some real dark stuff when you get up to the higher levels. I mean, yeah, at St. Peter's Square, they have like a an obelisk that comes from Egypt. Like you would think that, wow, Christendom would want. Yeah, it was actually brought from to Rome by Caligula, literally right mm-hmm. in front of St. Peter's. You can look that obelisk up. I mean, you would think that it would be the opposite. The Old Testament's railing against these towers and occult things around uh, amazing ancient israelites israelites and there you have it right in rome right in front of your face do you think that might have been on chesterton's part a little bit of a blind spot that he chose to just because he wasn't really honestly investigating everything about catholicism he, he seemed to kind of use it as a as kind of a bulwark a fortress of faith from which to you know focusing outward at like all these new world order philosophers and nietzsche and fighting the the good fight but do you think he maybe missed that part i mean back then obviously it wasn't quite as evil as it is now too i think but. well that's a good point i mean it might have been different i think that people are attracted to the church capital c church and that yeah. may have been chesterton's desire was to be like i want to be part of this what they what they state or ostensibly state is their tradition back to christ or peter so yeah yeah I think that that may have been, but I, it's a good that I'm glad that you brought it up because for me at a very surface level, like you went back to the Catholic church, that was where your end was. It's kind of, yeah, like, feels like a head scratcher. So, um, but you know, it doesn't take away, it doesn't take away from his fundamental writings for me. I didn't feel like I was reading Catholic as somebody who came up in the Catholic church, not a very active Catholic okay. by, any, by any means, but 
when I read orthodoxy, that was not anything in my mind. Like he was, okay. he was repeating Catholic orthodoxy specific to the Catholic church, you know, or even to Eastern orthodoxy or anything. I didn't feel like he was stating that the apostles creed to me, is fairly benign. Maybe I should read it again. Although I did read, there was another creed that he was talking about, which was a lot weirder, which was the Nicosian creed, the one that comes out of each the Egyptian church. Okay. That? So he talked about the Trinity, Trinitarians, okay. but, uh, yeah, I mean, you you also kind of have to parse through and get kind of a finer grain understanding of what his real Catholicism was and how he came at it. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of different types of Catholic Catholicism too. So anyway, but I probably have the same reservations and misgivings that you have about that. And I'm sure, you know, if he was here today, I can, I can speak for him. You know, I, I called him on the phone earlier before the interview and I, I honestly, I've had dreams with Chesterton speaking to me while I was engaged with some kind of spiritual warfare against some demon like Pan or something, some, you know, demon of the mind, you know, trying to find, and I recall this so vividly that Chesterton was talking to me and I didn't even know what his voice sounded like. His voice was actually a little bit high. Is that, new? <laughs> is that true? Listen, there's one recording of him. Oh, interesting. He has a, not quite like Mickey Mouse, but I, I forget what he sounded like. But he had a, a, a higher, I was kind of surprised. You know, you'd think of him as like this, this deep, sonorous new speaker. In, in Have you ever heard a recording of Aleister Crowley? Yes. Yes. Yeah, he was the same way. Him. He had a kind of a high, reedy voice. Oh, to him, to Pan. That's the way he sounded. Really? He didn't like sound this, scary he, at all. Like, that's why people would probably walk by him. They just thought he was a doddering old weirdo. Oh, wow. Hi, wow. my hymn to Pan. The great day of tomorrow. You know, that's what it sounded. I can play it. I'm going to see if I can find it. Okay. And uh, since we're being silly here, I guess we could talk a little bit about uh, his sense of humor. Um, this is from a 1911, um, March 11th, 1911 essay called Two Kinds of Paradox. Just a little quote here. There's nothing that needs more fastidious care than our choice of nonsense. Sense is like daylight or daily air and may come from any quarter or in any quantity, but nonsense is an art. Like an art, it is rarely successful, yet entirely simple when it is successful. Like an art, it, it depends on the smallest word and a misprint can spoil it. And like an art, when it is not in the service of heaven, it is always, almost always in the service of hell. So just the the ability to make jokes in his mind, obviously he's in the service of heaven and what he was doing, but, and his jokes were just so like, they would be mean. These were the memes of 108 years ago that he was, he, he was writing regularly for newspapers. He was engaged against the libtards of his day, you know, the, the haters of humanity, the progenitors of eugenics. He wrote a book called Eugenics and Other Evils. And the, his way of combating them was very much like like a superhero movie today where you know you got Captain America you know fighting whatever bad guy and even though it looks like he's about to lose and all oh, the world's about to be destroyed he still makes jokes like, oh, I could do this all day <laughs> and it, that's like the thing that makes Marvel so successful is the humor the writers are, are obviously oh, very right. talented that they hire and Chesterton was kind of like that like he would fight these falsehoods and these demons all day and he would make jokes and um and he would be a little bit nonsensical and the more you know the smarter you are the more wisdom you have the funnier your jokes can be that's what i've right his I've references definitely... are good it brings to mind this quote from c.s lewis like the devil hates to be mocked you know so like you can make fun of him all oh, right here's, get... Crow here's crowley the poet let's fire it up see all if, right see if you can hear this i don't know if it'll work with my headphones well, let's see if it'll work. Come on. There you go. Can you hear that? That's Crowley, 1920, so he's 45. You there? 
I'm trying to find a Chesterton okay. sound now. Let's, let's get let's get a. Let's go back to back. Crowley Chesterton. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find his. This is like a teensy. This is like a thirty second, fifty second video. Um, very very old. Nineteen thirty one. That's not him. What? That's it. That's, That's the good. only recording of Chesterton. I like the, I like the sound of the voice. That was a good, uh, good, good little humor to start off his talk. It's good. <laughs> yeah, he's he's definitely a, a funny guy. You know, if he had a radio um, mic and if it was accessible in his day, I bet you he would have been a very prolific um, broadcaster. I bet. Um, you okay. know, out there fighting a the good fight. But it's up to us, Mister Ramsey. Well, it's actually interesting, too. Another one of his contemporaries was Huxley, right? So he's, like, writing yes. and referencing all this Huxley's dad. Yes. Forgot his first name. But, uh, you know, he's he's going to battle against the evolutionists and really kind of yeah. making great points about how they they think certain thoughts, but their their thoughts really aren't evolving like their, um, their so-called scientific materialism is. He's, he's very clever. There's very clever stuff in there. Wow. What else stood out um, in orthodoxy as far as uh, having freshly read that? That's gold if you just come out of that nice mental bath. Um, It's interesting, too, because he credits Huxley, Herbert Spencer, who's another evolutionist, and Bradlaugh back to orthodox theology. So he was analyzing them, and they're like, hold on, these guys don't even uh, pass the smell test. I think he says he says here... (laughs) It was Huxley and Herbert Spencer and Bradlaugh who brought me back to Orthodox theology. They sowed in my mind my first wild doubts of doubt. Our grandmothers were quite, were quite right when they said that Tom Paine and the free thinkers unsettled the mind. They do. They unsettled mine horribly. The rationalists made me question whether reason was of any use whatever. And when I had first finished Herbert Spencer, I had got as far as doubting for the first time whether evolution had occurred at all. So, so he's <laughs> reading them and saying that I'm not convinced, right? Yeah. So it's <laughs> oh, that's like great. the opposite of their what you would think. Like, oh, this guy, this is actually making me think it's true. Well, as we're as where we are in, in um let's just bring things to the fringe too. Like Steve Quayle, L.A. Marzuli, all this kind of bringing back the legends of the giants and the Nephilim. And I was on Julian Charles' show, The Mind Renewed, a few weeks ago and and he's i'm literally at, at work and messaging him like what are we going to talk about he's like anything but nephilim because <laughs> <You know, laughs> there's so many shows that everybody wants to do about the nephilim and the, the giants but right. if you incorporate chesterton into that um kind of understanding it's interesting to note that he spoke quite a bit about elfland um that chapter about the ethics of elfland and he of course takes a more mystical approach to it and, and philosophical kind of like, it's like a fairy tale, you know, what we're, I, I can't quote it from memory. I haven't read it in, in a decade, but it's just that um, return to legends and lore and mythologies and taking them more seriously than even normal histories. I never saw it coming a decade later that we would get into all this fringe stuff not necessarily right, back, right, but yeah. the, the existence of giants that a lot of these people are are uncovering um we have a new show on the network about bigfoot that's fascinating um a couple guys reading bigfoot accounts and that kind of thing so it's it makes you um really treasure the worldview and sort of the maybe not very kosher in the eyes of the world but like right. the world is so much weirder than, yeah, than yeah. what evolution could ever say. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that that's, that's definitely another kind of aspect of his writing, at least in the orthodoxy. Yeah. Is like, it's okay to have the, ima- he actually, you know, like I said earlier, the imagination triumphs over the, the materialist rationalist, which you wow. a lot. So isn't that a quote by um, Einstein or did Chesterton? Perhaps. 
I don't remember I that one. That. Imagination. I have it here in my notes. Well. Wow. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. There is something like that. I think he okay. said imagination is more important than rationalism. I can't remember. But he also, uh, another thing that was interesting, he also kind of counterpoises optimism, pessimism, and yeah. general positions. He included yeah. a lot. It goes back to Marcus Aurelius, Greek thought. So you yeah. just see that kind of real classical learning that, uh, yeah. you know, he wasn't afraid to put into a Christian, generally Christian apologetical work. No, not at all. Um, it's amazing that he was tackling literally the, the philosophies that were going to murder hundreds of millions of people to come in the next decades, you know, his, his brother died in world war one. He, he went through that horror of, of he saw all that, that uh, trauma, but then he was basically exposing kind of in a much more gentlemanly way, but basically the info wars of his day was exposing these evils that were coming. But the way that he did it was with so much optimism. You're right. It was so, you would never feel that sense of despair and hopelessness that you feel when you spent a little bit too much time on YouTube watching one too many documentaries about, um, and you know, I mean, you, you have way more guts to face some of this stuff than most of us for long periods of time. But that sense of just like, Oh, I've been staring into the abyss a little bit too long again. <laughs> the abyss is staring oh. back at me. and I'm feeling yucky today. <laughs> you know, it can get pretty dark, man. It's really dark. Nine eleven itself is just dark and dark as it gets. But here's a, here's a Chesterton on optimism. <clears throat> I had called, often called myself an optimist to avoid the too evident blasphemy of pessimism. But all the optimism of the age had been false and disheartening for this reason, that it had always been trying to prove that we fit into the world. The Christian optimism is based on the fact that we do not fit in the world. So I found that to be pretty interesting. So different bases for optimism. You know, I think that theme is beautiful. Definitely, yeah, definitely plays out plays out in the New Testament for sure. Well, well as, yeah. you know, there's there's uh, news about the UFOs that the NASA or the Navy right. and the Air Force is trying to put out there, and it's slowly we're moving towards that disclosure while the New World Order people have decided that humanity needs to be shut down. We're not going to space anymore. It's just the robots are. Right. And what an optimistic perspective to look into the cosmos and to bring with us these kind of treasures and to find, you know, God's seed in us, all of us. And to, against that backdrop, see the, the worshipers and the continuers of the Crowley line that they're like grasping and grabbing for the, the chalice of wisdom and power and fame. To keep like it for Clinton. themselves. Right. And, and behold, I mean, we have a Trump in office and of course he's, being attacked from all directions maybe maybe that will fail maybe the american experiment will be will be uh will go into this sort of abyss of of war that many right. people have foreseen but this the spirit of liberty and joy and humor and optimism i mean we're gonna have to go through i believe our testing our time of, of darkness as prophesied in the bible I heard the new Godzilla movie is really good too, to kind of throw it one more. In in there. Well, I mean, you can, but, uh, you can put what exactly what you're saying right now. Bilderberg is going on in Montreux, yeah. right? All these people yep. secretly meeting. They don't want people to know. They literally had a topic called, what was it? I think it was called the weaponization, weaponization of social media. So, oh, yeah. which, which begs the question, what are the other topics? So are you talking about the weaponization of just regular media? Like that's what, that's what kind of that title elicited in my mind is like, what the hell are you guys talking about? But I think it's a perfect example of like a secret, yeah. you know, Marvel level group who yep. are trying to uh, steer the helm of the elite against, you know, just the mass of people, the slave shall serve. That's Crowley's idea. Keep them with the quiet wisdom of the cattle. And uh, I only yeah. heard recently that the Builder, the Bilderberg group, um, the Bilderberg group, did, did you hear something that they met in New York before 9-11? Do you hear that story? I vaguely recall something about that, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did have a number of meetings before that because of what happened after 9-11 and the Patriot yeah. Act and 1 and 2. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you're right, though. I totally agree. We're, we may go through something in the future. We're going through something now. 
You know, we've already been through Bush, Obama. Trump is amazing, man. He's really up against very powerful secret forces. The whole idea of the whole Russia thing was just a big scam to waste time, told the statute of limitations. I mean, it's very clever. It's a total psyche bomb. I mean, they worked it out on a variety of different levels. Fool the public, create mass hysteria. So you've just seen you as a, as a, I mean, you, the people of the United States have seen just an incredible, incredibly ornate, thought out conspiracy right in front of their face. And whether those people are ever going to get any form of justice from that is unknown to me. It's a massive waste of time too. Massive waste of two years. Exactly. And when you, when you talk to people who are awake about this, it's like, brother, you know, I'll tell you in Hawaii, it's very hard to find anybody. Uh, it'll be like, I'm going out to, you know, get a late beer from the, the longs drugs. And I'll ask the security guard, would you just mind watching my bike for just one minute? I've got, they're going to close the alcohol thing closes in five seconds. I got to run in there. He's like, all right. And, and I come out and I'm thank you. And I talk to him and I find out he's a major red pill wake guy and i give him my card and i'm like look we got this network we have a studio right here in waikiki and we're we're trying to reach out to other podcasters and we're networking and it's like we're we're here man we're here we're doing it and he's like yeah and he's like doing the graveyard shift you know <laughs> yeah. one in a million but hey those are the kind of people that that we're talking to that are listening to your podcast you have a great audience by the way Oh, thanks. Likewise, I think that a lot of people are unwilling to talk about it in public because I think a lot yeah. of people know are really, they're just really hungry for information, good information, which is yeah. why CNN, they're literally like YouTubers who have 10 times the audience on a weekly basis than CNN. <laughs> and these jokers like Don Lemon yeah. and uh, Vanderbilt, whatever is that, uh, what is it, Cooper, Tucker, no. Anderson Dr. Cooper, oh, Anderson yeah. Cooper Vanderbilt, they're getting paid like big dollars to just deceive people. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't yeah. think it's going to stick for much longer, honestly. And you've seen this thing on YouTube that now the go-to defaults on the algorithms are all these crappy corporate, corporate media. Like, Oh my God, yeah. if, you, if you put it through the, these queries, all you get in response from media is CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Yes. Oh, for me, it's disgusting. Yeah. So um, YouTube is a real problem. I've had so many. Yeah, don't even get started on YouTube. So there's a lot of changes happening. Things are still happening in our face. And I think that some of these ideas of Chesterton still relevant, remain relevant in current times, definitely. Yeah, I hope the audience doesn't think we're we're just like done talking about them too. Like all the stuff that that William Ramsey is talking about on, on his show is absolutely connected to thousands and thousands of quotes and topics um the paradoxes the the shipwreck of the past the wonder and wouldn't I'm, I'm reading divorce versus democracy mormonism i mean he has so much darwinism and mystery um you know and and the overall spirit of optimism while you're fighting them, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to ban memes right now. I, sometimes I'll go on Gab or MeWe. Um, if anybody wants to follow me on social stuff, this Kindle goes right to Twitter too. If I highlight something and I put, it pushes share, it only lets me post it to Twitter. So I'm like, okay, they haven't deleted me there yet. So if people right. want to follow me reading Chesterton, I'm going to be putting lots of quotes to my. Have you got some canned off of Facebook yet? Almost. Um, oh. I'm, I'm gearing up for that because there are messages that I'm just sending in messenger to friends that are just like, this violates the standard thing. I can't even send a freaking message because the AI algorithms decided I couldn't send that link or I couldn't send this specific sentence. Uh, people are telling me and screenshotting my profile and showing some of the memes that I'm pulling off of other social media sites like MeWe, which I hope people will follow William Ramsey there too. Trying to, I'm trying to get to um, do more posts there. For sure. There's this one guy on MeWe that posts the most funny, funniest memes. I, I'm always grabbing those and reposting them to Facebook and getting in trouble. And Facebook is like, um, oh, we, they actually have people like going through memes and checking wow. them to wow. to put little like, oh, this isn't true. Obama did help pay for some of those charities for the children and you know some meme making fun of how the obamas barely ever did anything 
So well, it's, well, it's interesting to see this phenomenon happen because I think the powers that be are gearing up for the next election and they're not going to yes. allow this kind of internet yeah. populism to have any roots. So that's why exactly. they're kicking people. That's why people are being deplatformed. That's exactly. why they're getting rid of all these memes because the memetics of the Trump and Trump campaign, which was really, uh, I mean, his campaign was a total dumpster fire, but that didn't <laughs> matter. What mattered is that people were fed up with the nonsense and they don't want a lifelong, yeah. you know, politician, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or anybody else, they don't yeah. want them in there. And, uh, I think that they're going to, they're going to try to fix this one and try to put this old creepy guy and creepy Joe in there who is just terrible. I mean, it's like a 30 year pop. He's like, I busted idea ever. Oh, he has the worst record. He got busted for cheating in law school. I mean, oh, really? he's all, yeah, he's had all kinds of scandals. He just, <laughs> oh, dude. So I think you're really going to see the, the, the hammers coming down on the man, on the people. And yeah. this alternate tech and everything like that is really going to be, especially with this election. I anticipate that these memes or anything critical of Biden, anything that makes fun of him, he looks like, you know, Biden reminds me of is uh, Fire Marshal Bill. You know, the Fire Marshal Bill sketch that's on uh, Living Color? Oh, yeah. You should, oh, watch, <laughs> you should watch Biden's speeches and Fire Marshal Bill together, man, right side by side. <laughs> He looks like freaking fire. Oh my gosh. So the, all these things that make fun of him are not going to be allowed. They're not yeah. Gonna be allowed. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Amazing. Amazing times that we're in. It's, it's hard. I know it's hard to stop everything and go and listen and read something like Chesterton, which even William Ramsey himself has said is not easy to just jump into one of these. You were, you were like, Oh, I'm going to read orthodoxy and everlasting man. I'm like, Bravo. <laughs> Ooh. I know. I was so oh. overconfident. Classic William Ramsey. Oh, I can pull this off. Let's do this. Come on, let's go. I mean, what? orthodoxy, I got to tell you, reading the book was definitely, like you talk about the word edifying, definitely. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you is how, what effect does it have on you as a Christian? I know you're not some kind of, hallelujah, everybody, I'm on the radio today. Does anybody need a prayer today on the William Ramsey investigate? I definitely put myself in kind of like the self, you know, uh, on the, like, I'm talking. All right. I got oh, I was about to destroy the show. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I just got punted off. I, don't, I didn't do anything. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we're still here. So. Okay. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah. I was going to say orthodoxy. Oh, yeah. I was kind of like the more of like, have, I'm a, like a wretched sinner type Christian. But I think that this wretched book itself, itself was like. Um, it's a very sobering, you know, edifying experience. I think altogether positive because I like the way he contextualizes his arguments. And there's definitely, you really have to sit there and think some reread the paragraphs a couple of times. And I didn't yeah. really know where he was going with his intro yeah. and talking about madness and the, the insane asylum. But I think the summation was really gratifying and very faith affirming for sure you know but from okay. a, from a much more austere intellectual uh, dispassionate but dispassionate type well not dispassionate but in a more um like an apologetics really just an apologetic position so for me it was definitely yes. worth the read yes i think it's it's worth if you have any inkling of a desire to go to seminary uh, just start with with reading him because those those dusty old books about orthodoxy are are just gonna they're faith killers really they 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 sap out all the passion all the curiosity all the vibrancy of meeting the real person of Jesus Christ and one of my other favorite writers um, Oswald Chambers oftentimes brings that out that in all of our efforts as Christians like we need to introduce the real man of Jesus Christ, not talk about him, not talk about the Bible. But if there's a way to introduce people to him, uh, Chesterton is one of those people that actually, I believe is imbued with that spirit, the living spirit of God as he's writing. There's just something very anointed about him. He's not just a charismatic guy that knows how to 
you know, talk and make jokes and be entertaining. He's really kind of a prophet actually when you read him. And some of the, like you said, sometimes you're like, where are you going with all this? Cause a lot of the times he's just having fun. He's basically his books. He's basically ranting half the time. Um, but he does read the news. Then he goes and he attacks the Aldous Huxleys and the people that were living in their nightmare scenarios, the George Orwell, 1984. Sure. I mean, George Orwell was way after Chesterton, but I think Huxley was probably I think around. Huxley was right around that time, was a little older. Yeah. So those Probably. concepts of a brave new world, of like living in a machine world, the Matrix, that was being birthed during his time and he was grappling with that monster. He was Godzilla, like attacking Mothra and all the, the multi-headed dragon and he was having a great time. <laughs> So it's, it's just too, I mean, if you haven't read Chesterton, like you've really missed out, like you've really, I agree hundred percent. I, you know, I feel like I should have read, probably read this 20 years ago, but you know, no, I was just not exposed to Chesterton. Shame on you, William. I know. I'll say it to my own own detriment, own detriment, but I got to be somewhere at 530. Mike, I got to run, bro. I have another engagement myself. Um. <laughs> well, I think we should do a part two and then talk about the everlasting man. I think Let's that's both, really what I'll I mean. pull we out some barely books. even covered it. Yeah, yeah. That that we could just go through just the topic of the structure of each chapter, and then, I mean, that book is the key to an intellectual understanding the gospel against the backdrop of all pagan civilization and not not um, alienating people. It really brings out the honor of the pagan and and in that in that kind of picture it's almost easier to meet jesus as a pagan rather than some western you know i mean and we can bring we can bring back the crowley side of that too that people are just so lost and they've been listening to rock rock and roll and not that i don't like rock and roll but i'm just like every song has something crowley in it practically and we're Pretty dealing much. with people that are in that system so i'm really looking forward to that and thank you so much it's such an honor to, to get to talk with you always likewise man likewise light for you. Sure. and you're a scholar and a gentleman mr ramsey so likewise, i love the tie man it's uh, righty. it's great that you you were willing to wear one for the <laughs> next okay, time next i'm gonna, time I'm gonna dress up tie. i'm gonna dress up gk chesterson tie t- uh, style right. next time we talk Awesome. Okay. All right, bro. God bless. All righty. Love you, man. Bye. Bless you.